Okay, in this video, I want to look at getting data in a standardized format that we haven't seen before. So we've seen raw text come into processing. We chopped it up into words, and we counted those words. We've seen tabular data, which is really wonderful. It's like, oh, I found all these numbers, and I want, I, I want to use these numbers. And look at this. They're just sitting right there, separated by commas. It's a very easy format. I know how to parse it, and I've got all these numbers. So this is what we're hoping for in life, that there's data that we want. We found the data, and it's in a standardized format, meaning I can read this format, in particular not me, but a computer program can read this format very easily. In the next video, or some video after this one, we'll look at data that comes in in a non, you know, just kind of as a mess. What do we do if I have to manually figure out, like, how is this data structured and organized, and it's not really meant for me to parse? There's still ways we can, we can solve this problem. But in this video, we're going to live in a happy place where the data is either in XML, can you see what I've written here? Extensible markup language, I believe that stands for, or uh, JSON. These are two formats I want to look at, JavaScript object notation. So um, these are uh, standards that have been developed in order for applications to serve up data. And this is what we think of as an API, an application programming interface, a interface for two different applications to talk to each other. One might be a web server, like the New York Times web server wants to talk to my processing sketch. <laughs> oh, how, how exciting. How do they talk to each other? By sending data back and forth in some standardized way that they each know about. XML, JSON. So one of the things we'll see is that, ah, we had this example with a table. We made these bubbles that had an X and a Y and a diameter and a label. We're going to see exactly these, these, we're going to see exactly this example duplicated in XML and JSON. But uh, more likely, uh, what the scenario you might be in is the following. And uh, here we go. Unfortunately, I'm wearing a green shirt today, which I, I need to attach the microphone to something, but you can sort of see through me. So this might be your scenario. You found something online, an API. It's free. I can get the data. I want to visualize weather information, open weather map. And if we read through this uh, page, we're going to find lots of documentation for how to get a particular piece of data. I've, I've already grabbed some for you. This is now, an, and you can see this is what we need to sort of start also getting used to, this idea of query strings. So looking here, we see there's a URL, <laughs> you know, google.com, amazon.com, openweathermapapi.org. And but what we're going to have to figure out in processing is how do we request the data with some specificity. I don't just want all the weather of all of the world. I want the weather in London. I want the data to be in XML. I want my units to be metric. And I want maybe seven, seven days worth of data, I believe. So we have to get used to this Q equals London and mode equals XML, these name value pairs that make up a, a, a request to a particular API. But we're going to see that in a little bit later. But it's good to kind of get that into our minds right now. Uh, and now you can start to see, oh, look, here's data. I have weather data. It's in a location. The name of that location is London. The country is Great Britain. Here's my some more la longitude and latitude and altitude and all sorts of other information. So this looks, this, there's something that's similar to a table here in that there's chunks of data in between these tags. So the interesting thing about XML and also JSON is the data is stored in a tree structure, which actually will give us a great deal more flexibility uh, and power in terms of organizing our data than simply a table would. So let's think about, uh, let's use weather. <laughs> I'm making this up on the fly. Hopefully it's going to be OK. So let's say I'm asking for weather information, and weather is the root of my tree. And then maybe I have a location, which is a child of the weather, which is London. And then maybe I have five children, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And each one of those has a temperature and a high and a low, like a current temperature, a high and a low. You can, I've got it going on and on here. But you can see, this is how you might think of the data. This is a bit more flexible than just having to have a flat data. There's only columns and rows. Here, we can have, sort of think of a database of objects. There might be another city that's coming in, you know, New York. And that has a whole bunch of days of weather. And each one of those days also has a temperature and high and low. So this is how the data is structured in a tree. Now, what does this actually look like? So I want to pull up, um, if you remember, uh, so I don't have all of this kind of just like ready to go on the fly here, but I'm going to go into our examples. 
And I'm going to look at, um, uh, where do we have load save table? This is an example we were looking at in the previous, one of the previous videos, and we had this table. Each one of these things has a label, has an x, y, and a diameter. And we can kind of imagine that that table is something that's quite a familiar, uh, quite comfortable for us to sort of think of this data in a table. X, Y diameter name, X, Y diameter name. Let's look at exactly this data in XML. So let's come back here. Uh, where was I? I had, oh, I was there, I was there a second ago, chapter 18. Um, let's look at load save XML, and I'm going to go into the data folder, and I'm gonna grab this piece of data, and do I have sublime text somewhere? No. <laughs> let's just open it in, uh, let's try that, yeah. And make it bigger, 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 come on. Here we go, here's the data. Oh, uh, ah, let me move it to the side. <laughs> Practice makes perfect, right? Okay, so you can see here, ah, there is a root node, Bubbles. Bubbles has four children, a bubble, a bubble, a bubble, a bubble. Each bubble has three children, a position, a diameter, a label. A position, a diameter, a label. Look, the position has two attributes, an X and a Y. The diameter has a piece of content, this. Label, the label has a piece of content, this, sad. So this, you know, this is how the data is structured. If there is a tree, each element of the tree has an open tag, like weather, and a close tag. Um, backslash weather. Each child then is inside of this particular node, like the city might be London. So city is a child. Now the city <laughs> might actually have other children inside of here, in which case I might put the n tag down here and then put some other children. The, the actual, where the line breaks are don't actually matter. That's just for us, the human being, to be able to see it. So as we start to look at data online, you're going to start, you're going to find the data like this and it becomes detective work for you. You have to figure out, okay, I, well, weather is the root, then there's city, and I want then uh, the Tuesday, uh, high temperature. So what is the path to that? It's the child of weather, the child of, uh, the, the first child of weather, and the second child of that child, and then the high attribute. So uh, if we go to an actual example where this happens, um, like, uh, uh, this is actually using Yahoo, uh, the Yahoo weather instead of open weather map. Um, and I run this, let's just run this to see that it works. We can see here, I'm getting today's high, oh, I'm not here. <laughs> I'm getting today's high is 72 degrees in this zip code, which is the zip code I'm standing in right now, and the forecast is partly cloudy. How did I get that? Come back here. We can look into the example. We can see, okay, first of all, this is kind of key. Look at this URL. I have a URL which is requesting that XML weather data plus zip, plus a variable, p equals zip. So let's just take this for a second and put this into the browser. And you can see that's the URL I'm going to, but there needs to be an argument, p equals what? I could get the weather in, uh, in where I am right now, 100. 03, that zip code, and you can see here's all of that XML data coming in. I could change this to uh, 90210, and here's the weather in Beverly Hills, California. All that weather is coming in. So while if I'm in the browser, I'm just typing this stuff up into the URL query address area thing, but in processing itself, I need to form that URL as a string and I can concatenate two strings together with the plus operator. So this is a very simplistic example. Um, if I were to pull up, I have another example which is loading from New York Times. You can see here, there's a bit more stuff going on. I'm searching for processing <laughs> in the newest article. I'm using an article search here. There's a query, there's a sort order. I also need to have an API key, so I have to form that URL. How did I figure out how this URL is formed? I'm simply doing that by going to uh, the New York Times website and reading through its documentation. So there's no like catch-all scenario here. I'm just kind of showing you all the bits and pieces, but you will have to do that detective work yourself. So back to uh, this weather example, how are we getting that stuff? 
load XML. So we saw load strings, gives us a text file. Load table, we can load a CSV, uh, uh, any type of tabular data. And now we have load XML, which is assuming that the, the, whatever the, the, the query is, a file, the URL, we're, what we're getting is XML data. And now XML.getChild, channel, item, Y weather forecast. Get the integer for the high temperature, get the string for the text. So this is how I search into a particular piece of XML data. Um, and if I, go, if I go back to the browser and we're looking at this, you can see, okay, what, what was it? It was, oops, it was channel item Y weather forecast. Look at this. <laughs> channel is first. Uh, uh, I already forgot. Let me move this over to the side here. Uh, oh, this was going so well. Channel item Y weather forecast. Okay. Channel uh, item. Where's item? Somebody find me item. There it is. Down at the bottom here. Item. Y weather condition. Is there a Y weather forecast? There it is. Y weather forecast. And here, uh, 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 that's the information that I'm looking for. So I'm kind of botching this because, uh, you know, I'll, have to, I'll try to redo this video at some point. But, um, but you get the idea. So you, you, you load a URL, you load it into load XML, and you find that piece of data you're looking for. In addition to a URL, we could see here that, uh, sorry, load save XML. This particular example, now I can run this example, which is just loading in, um, an XML data file. This is the tabular data with bubbles. And look at this. Here we go. I want to get, give me the position, then give me the X, then give me the Y, then give me the diameter. So this is the syntax, much like how we looped through a table. We, we looked at every single row and every single column. Now we have to look at every single child. And in each child, let me pull out that X value. Let me put out that Y value. And the same way that um, in table we could then save that table data back out. We can also save XML data back out. And you can see that's happening right here. Save XML data slash XML. Okay, so that's kind of like a haphazard, <laughs> uh, very scattered description of XML and looking at a few scenarios. Here is, now let's look, think about JSON. So JSON, JavaScript object notation. Now, if we'd been programming all along in JavaScript, we'd be like, yay, we're done. JavaScript object notation is just the syntax of JavaScript. And in JavaScript, you can make an object like this. Uh, I'm going to say var particle equals open curly bracket, close curly bracket. You know, x is at 100, y is at uh, 200, and uh, the diameter is 52. So this is a line of code in JavaScript, which is declaring an object, literal, an object literal, a, a, a particle that has an x, a y, and a diameter. And we've kind of seen this in processing. Class particle, float x, float y, float d. So this is kind of like, instead of a template, this is just making the object itself. What's interesting about JavaScript object notation is if you put this into a text file, this is exactly the syntax for storing that data. So if I come back over here, and I were to go to, uh, let me find load save JSON, and I'm going to open this JSON file. We can see now, the, oh, I'm not over here. I'm really screwing this up. Um, we can now see that this is that same data in JSON format. There is something called bubbles. What is that? It's an array. That square bracket means an array with a bunch of things in it. Each one of those things separated by commas has a position, which itself is an object with an X and a Y, and a diameter, which has something, and a label, which is a string. So this is now a standardized format for that particular uh, data. And if I look into the code, we can see what's happening. OK, I need to load that JSON file. What's in that JSON file? An array of bubble objects. For each array, give me, the, give me the object in each one of those arrays, and then give me the position, give me the x, give me the y, give me the diameter. So the, you know, I'm not going through like the, the nitty gritty details of this syntax. I think that if you looked at all three of those examples next to each other and all three data formats, you would start to see how are things organized. Columns and rows, XML children, 
JavaScript JSON arrays, which is a list of things, and JSON objects, which is a collection of, of properties with a name, like position, and a value, like 12 comma 13, an X and a Y. So this is how we're working with data, and uh, I think I'm kind of wrapping this up here, but I, th I think it might be useful just to see uh, a JSON example. So this, by the way, okay, so here is the, that New York Times example, which, uh, which goes to the New York Times API, searches for the word processing, sorts it by newest, um, and then we get all of this JSON back. So you can see here, this is kind of a mess. This is very, while this is very easy for a computer program to read, this is very hard for us to see. One thing that you can do that I think is useful to see, I'm gonna take this, copy, paste it. There's a site, uh, JSON Formatter, um, that I can just paste all this like garbled JavaScript uh, JSON in, and I'm gonna hit uh, process and it formats it nicely for me. So now if I look at this full screen, I can start to like see like, ah, okay, so where is that? There's a response um, and uh, it has some docs, each has a URL, oh, there's a headline, main Australia issues blanket visa on a bowl. I should search for something different. <laughs> um, but uh, you can see here's the headline and if I go into processing, and go to this New York Times API example, and I run this, you can see, ah, I have that exact same headline now showing up in processing. How did I do that? Um, uh, and uh, you can see here that, uh, what did I do? I said, okay, I got all that JSON data, then I looked for the response, then I looked for docs, and then I looked for, uh, the first element, index zero, and then I looked for the headline, and then I looked for main. So what we, that detective work essentially that we did by figuring out that it's a ah, response, docs, then there's an array, I need the first one, then I need headline, then I need main, that is mirrored here in, the, uh, in this processing sketch by looking through all of these pieces of JSON. Okay, so I don't know how, how useful this was because it was kind of a smattering of lots of things and I like one video with both XML and JSON in it, but you can see, so what I would say to you, what's your exercise now? Find a data source online. I will try to link to a whole bunch of examples of things. See if you can pull that data into processing and try to just pull out a singular unit of information, a temperature. Uh, article headline. And then, you know, once you've done that, you might start looking for, oh, can I get larger amounts of data? Can I get how many times from the New York Times a certain word appears every year from, you know, 1950 to 2014 and draw a graph of that. So, um, so this is some beginning steps and uh, I will say goodbye and I will hear from you someday when, when about this particular video. Goodbye. <laughs>